and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Barry James to our colloquium today. She's an associate professor of public administration in the School of Public and International Affairs at NC State. And Dr. Barry James research and teaching focus on social equity program evaluation and research methods. And her recent book, Why Research Methods Matter, focuses on evidence-based decision-making in the public and nonprofit sectors. Uh, Dr. Barry James is a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration, a congressionally chartered nonpartisan nonprofit. And today she'll be talking about does responsible innovation really matter? Examining cultural perceptions of biotechnology and food systems. So thank you very, thank you very much, Dr. Barry James, for being here today. And I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you today. Uh, today is a significant day. It's, um, it's the Scholar Strike Day, where many scholars, including myself, are um, taking some time to really focus on some of the challenges that we see, not only in our work, but also in our society, specifically challenges that address um, racial injustice and um, racial inequities. And so I, I wanna say that this is an important day for scholars like me and for scholars who are interested in being responsible in the kind of work that we do and the, and the findings that we produce, the knowledge that we create that's usable for our society. So thanks for having me today. So as you said, I am going to talk a little bit about a study that I um, that was funded by the GES Center at NC State. It's called Responsible Innovation, Cultural Perceptions of Biotechnology and Food Systems. It evolves a bit, so I'll just, I'll just sort of try and um, move the slides along, see if we can get this to work for me today. Yeah. So initially... <clears throat> I want to acknowledge that I had quite a bit of help on this particular study. It was funded um, in 2014 generously by the Genetic Engineering Society Center. In particular, I worked with two doctoral students, one student who was an Eigert Fellow, Sharon King, and the other student who was um, my advisee in the Department of Public Administration. And she's since gone on to be a, um, a, a practitioner. She works as a, a, an assistant director of institutional research or a director of institutional research. Her name is Melanie Reister. And so they helped me conduct these focus groups during the summer of 2014. And of course, all along the way, including um, the initial support for this kind of study and also really to help expand my viewpoint point and my practice, Dr. Jennifer Kuzma has been an incredible mentor for me. So let's see where we'll get started talking about this particular issue. Um, I don't know if you follow the GMO food debate, but it continues to rage in the American context. You have um, scientists who weigh in on food biotechnology. You have um, practitioners or government folk, right, who weigh in and talk about it's safe or not safe, uh, mostly that it's safe. You have um, physicians, the American Medical Association, for example, who also weighs in to say, well, yes, it's safe, but wait a second. Every time we introduce a new food into our market, we definitely want to see the scientific evidence to demonstrate that it is safe. And so a lot of times what you do is you find consumer skepticism. People really are polarized with respect to food, food safety and genetically modified foods in particular. Um, some of the views on food safety are really polarized between citizens and scientists. They differ sig significantly and meaningfully, right? Um, and so a lot of what this study does is it really looks at um, the differences, but it pulls in a group of people who often aren't included in, in research. And these are African-American people who eat food too. And they eat organic food, um, they eat GMO food, um, they just eat food, right? But very often when you look at some of the studies that have been done nationally, while they might be generalizable using a sample to the greater population, the reality is they don't include a significant or sizable African-American population or sample that mirrors the population. And so my study focused specifically on African-Americans in order to contribute to the knowledge that we, um, that we have about this particular group. 
And so um, some of you may know that there is a stream of distrust and mistrust that runs in the African-American community for good reason. Some of the mistrust and distrust um, happens because of historical issues. And then they also have real implications. In fact, COVID-19 is... Um, one of those um, real implications that we often see in society, we know that African Americans are disproportionately impacted by a situation like a pandemic, but also the epidemic of racism has had real implications on the lives of African Americans as well. And so I think this study is really important in that it really brings another voice to the table and it really helps scientists and um, students of science really understand some of the skepticism that um, continues to persist in our society. And so I'd love to pivot and I hope we'll have time. I'll pace myself if I can find my cell phone um, to make sure that we talk about responsible innovation and the what that really looks like and how can we unlock meaningful pathways into groups that are underrepresented. And by underrepresented, it's an exponential effect, right? So we know that African-Americans are not underrepresented in our society. However, they are underrepresented in our workplaces. They are underrepresented in our educational spaces. They are underrepresented in our um in our studies, our scientific studies, but they're not underrepresented in our um, society. And so what you could say is that, well, in fact, there's a degree of overrepresentation when you look at some negative effects, right? So the overrepresentation, um, definitely in the criminal justice system, the juvenile justice system, um, for folks, people who are living and experiencing homelessness, African Americans are overrepresented in that group too. And so, what I'm looking to do is bring a voice into a very important space as we talk about science and the way in which we not only transfer knowledge but create us usable knowledge as well. So, I want to tell you that. Um, I am a social scientist, which means that I like to talk to people and I like to understand people's viewpoints and perspectives and behaviors. Um, and so in really beginning this type of um, work, I wanted to make sure I knew a little bit more about GMOs and the way in which crops are being produced in our country in particular. And so I'll tell you that my story um, regarding GMOs began more than almost about 18 years ago when I first became a parent. And I was very interested in the type of food, um, not only that I bring into my house, but I feed my children. Me and my children, we all suffer from extreme food allergies. And so we, we also suffer from environmental allergies and um, there are quite a few allergies that really um, cause, cause a parent to be alarmed, especially when you have food allergies. And so I've been avoiding, had been avoiding GMO foods, um, only feeding my children um, non-GMO GMO foods or non-GMO products, that kind of thing. And so I went back to take a look at, you know, how long is GMO, how long have GMOs been in, in our um, in our system and what crops in particular are um, GMO affiliated crops. And so you see here on the screen that we have a long history in the United States of genetically modified organisms with respect to crops um, that from 1996 until 2020, I went back and updated this particular study. You see that about 90% of soybeans, cotton, and corn are all GMO produced in the United States. And so despite the fact that the percent of planted acres in the United States are is high, you know, 90% for those three crops, the reality is that skepticism is also high. And I'll share a little bit about what I found with you. Um, one of the really important aspects of my life and my job and my role as a researcher is really understanding the role of government, not only just the role of government as a discipline, the field of public public administration really is the study of government. And so we examine policies and programs and practices and approaches that are used to make government work and make government work for all. But GMOs, um, or let's just say government's role in the production of genetically modified crops is a really significant role. I mean, there are three key, key aspects here. You see that on the slide. One is regulatory, the other is market facilitation, and the third is research. And so by regulatory, we mean that um, the um, agencies like um, 
any one of them, USDA, FDA, and EPA, they all sort of work together, coordinate the work in which they do to make sure that we can um, have approval of field tests. You know, in some countries in Europe, for example, I read recently that some of those, uh, the reason why GMOs are not so popular and the science is being questioned there is because the field tests never, they never make it, right? When they're using small farm field tests. And so it causes, or it, it continues to allow people to feel skeptical about the safety or the benefit of that that crop, a particular crop. Um, and market facilitation, here we're looking at the way in which um, testing and research are used to promote GMOs that, as a product in particular in various markets. And then the research, the research really zones in on the biosafety analysis that is being provided to these three agencies um, from from different different companies. Um, and so the, the point of it all is, is that this is really a coordinated way in which um, government is involved in um, the production of food and the production of food in our society. And so lots of the questions that, that, that people have, and I think the skepticism too, um, could be in part no, not so much for this because of the scientists or because of the farmer or because of the crop, but it could be. At least I want to open up the possibility that it is or could be because of the role of government in a particular community. And so we'll talk a little bit about that later. So I just want to acknowledge right up front that um, I won't tell you which GMO products I eat outside of the house, but I will say that um, there are a lot of benefits for ag biotech, and those benefits are to farmers, producers, and consumers, but we also have some benefits around uh, pest control and weed management. Um, we know that um, these crops are often safeguarded against diseases, and that means that they become more productive and more profitable, and so that's a good thing. And then we also know that... Um, we can reduce use, the use of pest of pesticides, which is also a very important concern of mine. Uh, we, we have an American hairless dog, and I don't know, I really should have put a picture of him on the slide. I'm not sure if you've ever met one, but he has no hair. And because he has no hair, um, he also is very sensitive to grass and um, cotton and um, carpet and other kinds of things that really touch his skin. And so we know that he also is very sensitive to pesticides and we, prob and we try and avoid those kinds of things. So the benefit of ag biotech, not just for people, but also for all kinds of things that we love, including food and our animals. I mean, there are quite a few benefits there. So I just wanted to share a few of them. But the safety considerations I think are, are worthy to be talked about, especially for people like me who are really just on the outside looking in when we think about science and the way in which science produces food for us. And so um, there are some concerns that maybe people like me talk about with their doctors or in their families or really talk about um, whether or not there's a potential transfer of something from in, in, in products that are GMO or whether or not there's a environmental effect um, that would change our birds and our mammals and our insects and our worms. I was commenting with a friend of mine the other day talking about the fact that there might be GMO um, mosquitoes being introduced into our society and what does that mean? Um, and where's the science with that? And how do we find that science out? Because it's certainly something that we need to know. And of course, you know, for people like me who are um, super sensitive and highly allergic, um, we always are thinking about toxicity and, and the way in which any product, new product, a new, new, um, not only just foods, but also um, all kinds of things are, are, are things that for super sensitive folks like me um, are really concerned about. And we talk about these kinds of things with our physicians as well. So I'll keep going. Um, I threw up this FDA statement of policy because I think that um, I'm a fan of the Federal Register, and so I might look at it a little bit, and you would imagine that. I'm a professor of public administration, and so I've known about the Federal Registry since I, like in 1991. So I've looked at the Federal Register for a while. And so this is the Federal, the FDA statement regarding um, GMOs or new methods of gen genetic modification. And it really lays out for the consumer, for those of those of us who look at it and are interested in what is this all about, it really lays out um, sort of 
under what circumstances does the government um, use regulation and use current practices to either um, approve or adopt or allow to be taken to market um, GMO type foods and so, or GMO foods, right? And so it lays out for the consumer that this is really not about um, um, toxins in foods or unsafe levels, that kind of thing. This is really, you know, from an outside looking in kind of approach, a market approach to figure out, well, is this acceptable? And can this product be taken to market? And are there any concerns that we need to maybe advise folks of? Um, and so that policy is there. So I just wanted to share that in particular. Now I'm going to pivot really to... Um, the research project that I worked on that really looked at cultural perceptions of African Americans regarding GMOs. And I'll, I'll speak specifically to um, the work that really interests me. I am interested in scientific mistrust. I'm interested in, you know, what are the reasons why people continue to mistrust or distrust science? And is it that they mistrust and distrust, mistrust or distrust science, or is it some other thing? But certainly uh, food skepticism persists. Also, I'm interested in the preferences. As I mentioned to you, um, for a very long time, I only fed my children um, non-GMO foods. And this work has me questioning, you know, what am I really doing? Do I know enough about it? Do I have skepticism too? Is there a place where I can get um, information about the truth, the risk and benefits or the truth and the science, right? Because all those kinds of things um, interest me as a parent, as a person, the purchaser of food, um, as a consumer, and also as a researcher. And so I'm looking to see, I'm trying to identify why people have some strong preferences like me or what is it is the preference because of what you know or what you don't know or is it because it tastes better? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, I have two two blueberries. One is conventional. One is um, organic. They both taste the same to me. So what is it exactly? Really, I'm trying to uncover some of that. And then looking at consumer behavior, really behavior that um, influences behavior that is influenced by GMOs um, is something that interests me. And again, the trust issue is really something I keep seeing in conversation, but also in the literature. And so I just wanted to share that there. And so. I had read a hundred different studies and maybe I came across a study that really talked about faith leaders um, in another life when I used what when I worked with a couple doctoral students who were interested in um, the church as a mediating structure for government. We talked a lot about the way in which congreg congregants are influenced by their faith leaders. And I thought, well, certainly if you have people in society who are interested in um science, and I think many, many, many of us are interested in science and are interested in the good work that science does, but still has some reservations or some hesitations about, um, you know, results. I wonder if faith leaders can be sort of a pathway to help us sort of have a conversation about about GMOs in particular, and really understand the way in which we sort of get more good science in our lives and um, learn more about the things that we're interested in. And so this sort of kind of led me on the journey. And I often thought about um, why is it that several studies, the studies that I are already published and the ones that I see, why is it that when I look at the demographic data that I see that not many African Americans are included in the study? What is it about um, race in particular that doesn't allow us to be um, represented in studies, right? And even if it's just surveys, um, what is it about that approach and how could I help find people who would talk to me about this particular issue? And so um, because I believe that the church sometimes is a mediating structure for government, I've seen that in lots of other different kinds of work that I've done. Um, I started there and <clears throat> My work was to go to a um, organization of religious leaders and to speak to them at their conference and to talk to them about this particular work that was approved and to ask them or invite them to be a part of my study. And I did do that. And so... Um, what I got was exactly what I anticipated. I didn't get anyone to reach back out to me to say, yes, I'll sign my church up and I'll help you recruit. And so I tried another another approach, another technique. 
I um, felt like this was a group that would be great to use a snowball sampling technique. And so I started with one person. I said, I would really love to conduct this study in your um, in your church. Would you allow that? And so he said yes. And um, I did. And after we finished the focus groups, we had about 10 people at his church. I said, you know, I wish if anyone else asked you how it went, I wish you'd tell them the truth. I wish you'd tell them that if you felt it was meaningful, it was a meaningful engagement um, with a researcher because if you do I think that it will allow other people to be interested in this study too and so um I went to another pastor and I said, hi, you know, I would love to part. I would love to have your church participate in the focus group. And um, I've conducted a focus group with this pastor and his his congregants last week. And so feel free to reach out to him. And so in that way, um, using a snowball technique to uh, capture the sample that I was interested in, I was able to get many more participants than I, than I um, anticipated. And so it was very easy to conduct this kind of work in the African American American church community. So I'll keep going. So we talk a little bit about responsive, responsible innovation, and there are all kinds of all kinds of things to consider. I wish you would also think about as you are um, um, just really uh, receiving the information that I'm sharing today is that there are also four prongs um, regarding responsible innovation. They deal with anticipation, ref reflexivity, inclusion, and responsiveness. I'm really focused on inclusion. I've been looking at um, some of the other scholars in the field that talk about inclusion as a mutually responsible responsive kind of perspective, but also as an intentional way in which we seek out other people. And so the thought is, is that um, scientists create usable knowledge that benefits society, right? Government um, plays a significant role in the work that science does or that scientists do. And um, the truth is, is that because scientists need consumers to accept, agree, um, relate to this kind of work, to view it as a credible source of information. I think that, um, you know, both scientists and citizens have to find mutual ways to talk, which doesn't always happen. I mean, in the university environment, of course, it happens all the time, right? We get all kinds of people interested in the work that we do, and we're also interested in specific subsection, subsegments of society. However, you know, the mutual responsiveness, um, the way in which we use um, the knowledge that we have and we transfer it, but the way in which to recognize the uh, trepidations of citizens, I think that's a really important aspect of responsible innovation. And I think I'll try and share a little bit more of um, that, that, that perspective along the way. So I wanted to share with you um, one of the quotes a quote from the American Medical Association, um, the policy statement that they put out regarding GMOs when there was this great debate and note the time is 2020, 2012. Um, and so it's like the, the position here is not one of incredible confidence. It's not, and, and I'm not finger pointing, but I'm just putting it out there that says, you know, the statement was that there's no proven risk to food, um, risk to foods coming from plants or animals, um, who GMO plants or animals, but before we take the product to market, we have to make sure that there's a safety approval process in place. And so I happen to actually see that um, partly because I read some of the medical association journals and, and follow them quite close, closely. Um, but, you know, I thought, well, wow, that's a that's a pretty interesting thing, because I think I saw a previous statement that said something like, oh, yeah, they're safe. And then there was sort of this flip flop with, oh, well, hold on for a second. Yeah, they might be safe, but anything that's new that comes to market needs to be go through the full approval process. And that's what made me sort of kind of pull back a little bit like, oh, what is this? Is this new is this new space of information I should be concerned about? So. Another study, uh, research, Pew Research um, study I wanted to share, share with you really talks about how we look at, um, how do we hold science, right? And it's almost like, it's the truth that um, 
many citizens and professionals hold science in, in high esteem and that the kinds of contributions that scientists like yourself and others, um, those contributions are really important in, in, our, in our world. And um, even though there is some sort of mistrust trust in government currently and has been for, for a really long time, the truth is, is that we believe that the investment as citizens um, is a good investment and it's the right investment and it's a desired investment. And so that has been consistent. I also looked at some data from that looked at uh, trust over time. I think it was about 20 maybe 20 years. And so um, the line graph looked very interesting. You could see distinctively that um, when you look at trust by race, um, the trust trust for whites is much higher than trust in the African-American and Hispanic community. And I didn't include that slide because my research assistant, who's awesome, she's an awesome doctoral student. I won't call her out, but she said it was too fuzzy and unclear. So I took it out. But if you're interested in this in the study, I do have the raw data for you. And so I'd be happy to send it to you. All you have to do is email me. So the origins of mistrust, like they are historic, right? Over time, um, there's definitely data when we're looking at um, mistrust and trust. Um, over time, there's data that looks at, you know, the differences based on race, ethnicity. And so there might be a couple things that really inform um, the dimensions of trust that we see. And so one thing particularly is the Tuskegee study. I can't remember the exact age that I learned about the infamous Tuskegee study, but I can assure you that it is well thought of um, um, when we start to talk to children about government in the African-American communities. When I say it's well thought of, I mean that it's thought of often, right? And so I learned at a very young age about the Tuskegee study and what, what actually happened. Some of you may know that for a very long time, there was a cure for syphilis, but um, that cure was not provided to African-American males in particular. And that um, as a result, um, some 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 people were interested. Public health workers were interested in the um, the 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 way in which syphilis um, impacted, you know, the health and well being of their particular um, their particular. A patient. And so um, there's a lot of other stuff, right, we could talk about with respect to the Tuskegee study, but there is actually, um, this is one of those things that while we can talk about it and we can file that research and we can promise to never talk about it, um, in communities, in Black communities in particular, children are talked about, uh, taught about it, right? We learned it and we know it, we understand the history with respect to it. And so there's this system um, in our society whereby a group of people may feel that they have been mistreated, a group of people may know that they have been mistreated, and a group of people may be able to prove, you know, the mistreatment, um, especially in, in, in public health and other areas. And again, I'll mention that COVID is, again, one of those kind of examples where um, what we see is, is that there is a particular group that is just being disproportionately impacted by the coronavirus, yet there are, there's not an overwhelming um, best practice or approach to really treat that particular group that's being affected. And so we see some of the, the causes or the root causes or root considerations in disparities that continue to exist and persist. So I want to show you some data, which I thought is really incredibly interesting. This is not the data. I've not collected this data, but I um, captured this data from the Pew Research Institute, which helps a little bit. Now, my research assistant, she also said this was blurry. So what I'm going to do is explain it a little bit. So in the first, all the way to the right, um, the first table you see, it's on views uh, on safety and genetically modified foods by key demographics. And once again, for this particular study, I am interested in race. And so when you look at the differentials between Black, whites, and Hispanics, what you see is that um, there were 68% of um, African Americans, for example, who say that GMO foods are generally safe. 
um, compared to 53% for whites and 65% for Hispanics. When you look at the middle column, it talks about views on scientific understanding of GMO crops. So this is the percent of US adults who say scientists have a clear or not clear understanding of the health effects of GMO crops. So these are, um, it, it's a little bit of a shift, but not so much, but 69% of whites say that um, science, scientists have a clear understanding of the health effects of GMO crops, 70% Blacks, and then 69% Hispanics. And then we go to the third column, which is um, who checks on GMO food labeling by key demographics. You see that in terms of the always and sometimes category, um, more Blacks than whites or Hispanics end up looking at the labeling. And so you think, hmm, what does that really mean? Um, don't know, right? Uh, it just states the fact. And so it's very interesting. I th thought those demographics by race are very interesting. And so they make me keep wanting to learn a little bit more about uh, cultural perceptions and other viewpoints around GMOs. I also want to I also am very interested in what science said, say. Uh, scientists often tell us very meaningful things about the things that they study. And so some of you know AAAS. Um, there's been a, a Pew Research Center also conducts a survey of all scientists. And so in this particular survey, these two pieces and points that I captured, um, there, there, is, there is data on food safety. Apparently food safety is a really important issue to be discussed over a long period of time. And so you find a lot of information there. And so the percent of um, scientists saying that the best scientific information guides government regulations in each area, um, you have 46%, it's kind of like 50-50 with respect to food, 46% for always or most of the time or 52% for um, some of the time or never. Now, if you go all the way to the right and you look at this other chart, it really talks about the positive views of si the state of science today. Um, and so the chart gives us the percent of scientists saying that they're, they're, this is generally a good time for science among those saying different things. And so um, when you look at food in particular, you see that it's almost like the same thing as 56 and 48%, 56% percent say the best science guides regulations most or always, most of the time or always. And then 48% says the best science guides regulations some of the time or never. So I don't know about you, but if you were me and I was really interested in food and food safety and food science and science and the role of science in government and you know, all those kinds of things, I was still a little bit like, oh, well, even the scientists don't think that they have a prominent space in um, the food that I serve for dinner. What does that mean to me? And so I keep looking. Um, with respect to a difference of opinion, right? This is a difference of opinion, not just based on what citizens say or how scientists feel. This is a looking at the two groups. And so with regard to um, with regard to safety, um, so the question is what percent of US adults and AAAS scientists saying each of the following. And one is safe to eat gen genetically modified foods. So 37% of adults say it's safe in comparison to 88% of scientists. And so you see that big 51 point gap and you think, oh, okay, well, why don't, why don't people know that the scientists have already said it's safe to eat? Um, so why don't we know what the scientists know as a citizen? And so when you look at um, the next aspect of this particular diagram, safe to eat foods grown with pesticides. Well, that's something that I'm always concerned about, um, mostly because I mentioned a lot that I'm hyper, I'm a hypersensitive kind of person, right? Have all these allergies to foods and all kinds of things. But 28% <clears throat> of adults say that 
it's safe to eat foods grown with pesticides in comparison to 68% of scientists. And so there's a real gap there again. And I think that gap is worth looking at. So I'll get to my study. Thank you very much for, um, for a little, at least allowing me to share some of the, the, the um, research that I looked at beforehand. Um, in my own study, I used what is considered to be a non-experimental design. Um, we conducted focus group interviews in African-American churches in Wake County, North Carolina, to really understand cultural perceptions of genetically modified foods. We asked par participants a whole host of questions. Um, I used a different approach. I told you a little bit about my snowball sampling technique to get African-Americans involved in the study. But I also, <clears throat> also gave that it, everyone a demographic survey so that before we started with the focus group questions, we wanted to make sure we have a good understanding of who was in the room. Um, we also talked about, um, asked them about other questions, like specifically questions regarding awareness, um, food safety, trust, which is really the subject of this presentation, choice, and social capital. And so I'll just share with you one dimension of the particular study. So I wanna give you an ex a, a summary of who was in the room. You know, we talked to a few people over time. And so um, we had about 70% of our focus group participants were women. Uh, and that kind of makes sense, right? Um, sometimes when you're talking about issues that, um, that um, pull people into the room, you know, sometimes you'll see that kind of breakout by gender, which I've seen that before. Like when I'm doing a study and I am, um, the study is being sponsored by a public institution, I might see people who represent public or the public interest uh, responding to the study. So that doesn't alarm me too much. Um, we also see that the average age of participants were 55 years. So that means that people were slightly older. Um, and I'll say that because I'm in that category. So I'm okay with saying that we were slightly older. Um, the other thing is, is that the average time spent in church, which was different and interesting to me was 21 years. So these are people who really have a vested interest in this church, in this church community, the pastor. Um, so I felt like that was really an interesting marker. And another um, interesting um, statistic is the average income. So the average income is $79,000 for this research group that I spoke to. And so that probably uh, correlates with length of time and age as well, length of time in church and age, um, and that these are people who've been in the community for a really long time and uh, they're working and that kind of thing. And then we had um, a large number of people who, not just single people, people who lived in the house with another people, some of which who had children. So that's the background of our group. So we asked them, um, and, and, and we asked them, I mentioned a whole host of questions, but for this time we asked who has perceived credibility regarding the truth about GMO foods. And so the two important questions here are, who would you, tell, who would you trust to tell you about the risks and benefits of GMO foods? And then who would, you tell, who would you trust to tell you the truth about GMO food? Uh, who would you trust the most? So who do you trust to tell you and then who do you trust the most? Okay. So here's a quick summary graph for you so you can get a sense of where people um, stood. So in the top three categories where we asked, who would you trust to tell you the tell you about the risks and benefits of genetically modified foods, 85% said that they would trust a researcher, 66% said they would trust their doctor, 60% said they would trust their pastor. And then when, we ask, when I, I press them a little bit, as you do in focus groups sometimes, you want to know well, who would you trust the most? If you only had one trust source, who would the person be to tell you the truth about genetically modified foods? And this is the thing that alarmed me a little bit. Alarmed me in that of all the possible categories of people to trust, they trust a researcher. Um, the most, right? So over half of them actually trust the researcher to tell, tell, tell us the truth. So when I looked at some of the truth commentary, right? Um, I think it's important to share with you, at least in this particular space, in this particular group, what people said about the researchers, whether it's an indicator of trust or mistrust. So um, some people said, well, with respect to the researcher, I would trust them. If I 
if I knew they have done research. So if they're actively engaged in this research space, yes, I would trust them. But then they sort of cautioning, sometimes people tell us anything, right? And then the other comment is my hesitation on that, just, just for me speaking, is if you're an independent researcher and you're looking for a certain result and it's your study, how do we know? Um, sorry about that. How do we know the numbers wouldn't be skewed um, to what you're trying to convey. So you see, again, that particular skepticism um, that people experience. And then when you ask people about their doctor, some of the comments were, yeah, I'll trust a knowledgeable doctor. But then some other com comments are, but the reason why I'm a little hesitant is because the pharmacist said one thing about the medicine side effects, the internet said another thing about the side effects, and my doctor said another thing about the side effects. So who do I believe? And that's kind of an interesting dynamic that not only would um, the person ask the pharmacist, but also also ask the doctor and then check the internet, which um, sometimes I find myself doing too. When looking at uh, trust dimensions uh, regarding the pastor, one comment was our pastor is always informing us about stuff. That's a good sign. And just about just important facts about just the world and how things happen. He's always informing us about things. I would trust him. And so the other piece of it is I would believe what my pastor says about the information, but I would ask him to give me the source of this information so that I can go and read it for myself. I don't know how many people are like me, but that's what I do too. Um, and then in terms of the supermarket, I thought that was a very interesting comment shared. When you say trusting supermarket to tell you, are they actively sharing this information? Are they passive about it? You have to read something or ask the questions. Are they coming straight out and saying this food here has been genetically modified and it has this risk associated with it or it provides this benefit? So that's a lot of information that the consumer is interested in with respect to genetically modified foods, especially as they understand uh, the way that food is marketed in the supermarket. And then I believe this is the last one about the government. Um, which says I do not trust the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. I don't trust any government agency because I always believe that there is crookedness in all government agencies and I believe people are paid off to approve something. So I really just subscribe to what my money says and my money says in God we trust. That was a very surprising comment to me. And then this is my last my last. Um, comment that I wanted to share. It's really about the farmer. I would trust the farmer because we do a lot of food at the farmer's market. We do buy a lot of food at the farmer's market. We do ask a lot of questions. And then the flip is that to get rid of some of their products anyway, the farmers are suffering now. So go back to an economical thing. The good old collard greens that he might have would have gave me they then told him, shoot them up, fill them up and do this and we'll give you so much money always. And so it's real skepticism regarding the way in which the farmer is planting and harvesting the crop. Um, I know that's a lot of information. I'm going to speed through this last um, couple slides. Actually, this is a thematic thematic pattern when we looked at um, the number of discussions that we had with participants, what we saw is that credibility emerged as a really important um, re really important theme as well as um, knowledge and um, information sharing and also agency or power. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So um, going forward, you know, I just want to say that I'm always looking for ways to engage the Black community. And quite frankly, I don't know where to start. And I think that um, looking at many different pathways to the Black community is a really important dimension of responsible innovation, just like the scientist wants the consumer to um, use the knowledge that's being produced. I also think that the citizen wants to inform the scientist of some of the concerns or um, continuous concerns or persistent challenges to questions or problems about science. And of course, everyone's, everyone wants government involvement. So I'll just share with you one little um, 
piece of research that I'd been looking at really talked about the ways in which um, we can engage citizens. And so, so many people have citizen participation organizers. Um, they invite um, people to campus to hear scientists talk or to hear people have conversations, meaningful dialogue regarding um, the role of science, but there are also super cool, exciting ways like science cafes, the focus groups that we created, scenario workshops, deliberative polls, citizen juries, consensus conferences. But another way is um, to get to the community is to really to use the church as that mediating structure um, and other kind of community oriented events. And so just in the, in, in the final kind of commentary here, I just wanted to share that, um, you know, there are really three areas in which um, Black lives and Black people, Black citizens, um, and Black scientists too matter. And one is around trust brokers that participants in this particular focus group study really um, trust independent researchers, doctors, and their pastors over government. As a credible broker, they view independent researchers as the most credible source to provide information on the risks and benefits of genetically modified foods. And as a cultural broker, and I mention that because one of the reason, one of one of the most surprising findings when I pressed them about um, this credible broker that they kept speaking of, that person who's an independent researcher who comes to the community to share information about scientific findings, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I said, well, who is it in particular has come to you? And they said, well, people like you who take your, who look like us, who work at the university, who understand what's happening. You know, what they're saying is people who have agency, right? People who have the power to share the truth or the power to share concerns concerns. Um, and so it's not a one-way delivery of information, but it's something that comes um, not, not only from the community to scientists and government, but also from um, government to scientists in the community, from scientists to the community, and also government. And I, so I think that, you know, I'll just stop there. I think that really is um, some, some usable information for all of us, whether you're a scientist or a budding scientist or a researcher um, who works in the social scientist or even an agent of government. I think that it's really important for us to find multiple pathways into the communities so that we can share usable knowledge and make a meaningful difference. Thank you so much. Let's see here. Yeah. Hmm. Let's see. So I'm see, I see there are quite a few questions in the chat. Um, yeah. Hello, Dawn, can you hear me? No, it's, I think I see you talking. I mean, I, I think you're talking, but I don't hear you talking. Okay, I can hear you now, but it's super low. Okay, so there is, let's see, let's see. So thank you very much, Jason, for sharing that link um, to an updated Pew study. I see that. So Jamie asks, what does social capital mean? Um, yeah, I think that um, in this space connected to my own study, social capital is the way in which um, people 
have a sense of, when we say community, a sense of community, meaning that for a church, um, social capital will be that you're a member of the church, you pay dues to be a member of the church, you see the church as the center of your community, you are actively and engaged in society, you vote, you go to school, you work, um, you're productive, um, you pay taxes, you see society as part of a space that you belong in. In fact, you have groups of people that you associate with who can help um, make policy, who can help deliver, implement programs, who can help understand practices that are legal or illegal. So capital is sort of where you fit in a society as well as um, the kind of power and influence that you have. So that's one. I'm sure there are lots of different, I mean, that's a great debatable kind of topic of what social capital is. Um, but I think that that's a good one for this particular research uh, group. And then the other, Dalton is asking, to what degree do questions about mistrust or trust of supermarkets in your study serve as a proxy for more general questions about trust or mistrust of the food industry? How did I define or and or... Okay, how did I define and or did your research participants define independent uh, researchers? So yeah, so I think that the research par participants, I'll, talk, I'll start with that question. They think of the independent researcher as someone who is um, not getting paid to talk to them about a particular topic, someone who's just doing research. Um, they also think about the independent researcher as someone who doesn't have a vested interest in the outcome. Some of them made that kind of statement. They also think about um, the independent researcher as someone who comes to them, right, as opposed to them having to come to the researcher, which you see in quite a few studies. And so that's how they thought about the independent researcher. I didn't define independent researcher for them. Those are concepts that emerged out of the um, discussion. The other thing I wanted to speak to um, you, Dalton, in particular about is the, the supermarket. And so we talked a lot about different types of supermarkets that they um, purchased their food from. So they had the high supermarket, the high end supermarkets and the community supermarkets. Um, but we did, but they, they brought up supermarkets and they talked about supermarkets in terms of what's available in their communities. And so um, we just, who do initially the question is who would you trust to tell you about the risk and benefits? And, you know, we, we, we go through and we we say, um, can you be specific? And one of the one of the ways that we conducted the game, but participant number two, please tell us, you know, where do you buy your food specifically, kind of thing. Um, and so that's how those concepts of researcher, doctor, pastor. Um, farmer, those kinds of things were contributed. Let's see, what else do we have? Oh, Todd, that's a great question. So you're asking, how do church leaders, pastors see their role in disseminating this kind of information? Are, there, are they concerned about appearing political? I think that's a great question. Um, to be honest, no pastor was in our focus group, right? So... Um, we didn't talk about um, that question to pastors, but certainly congregants um, go to their pastor for lots of different things. In fact, the government has a faith-based um, arm where they use that particular arm to disseminate information in the community. And so while some people may think of it as appearing political, all the times I've been in church, especially during election, um, I've always had 
um, someone who's running for office, who seeks the Black vote, who wants to um, appeal to the Black community, they always sit in church with us. So there are some um, welcoming of people who um, are employed politically, just like as a researcher, you're employed as a researcher. But the truth is, is that it's not necessarily, at least the way I see it, it's not necessarily a a political action, right? It is really bringing information to congregants, this group of people that you care for and you provide spiritual counseling. And in church, they serve food. um, So you provide some nutritional guidance every Sunday for people. Um, You also provide kind of spiritual connections for them. And very often there's a health ministry as well. Let's see. So I'm getting a note from Dawn that we should end with Paul's question, which is, I'm going to find it. Uh, So Paul is asking, I'm encouraged that the scientists and researchers are held in high regard, but scientists have also been told not to communicate on facts, but instead on values in order to best connect with the general public. Do my findings support this? And what suggestions do I have for the science community to better educate the general public on topics, especially uh, controversial topics or debatable topics? topics like food safety and GMOs, I think it's really up to scientists to get the word out, right? To share news you can use. Um, There are many different ways in which you can reach communities. And I think that it's really important for science science to um, share the facts. Um, I don't know why you wouldn't share the facts, but um, I think that there's no real fact value dichotomy. In fact, um, that that the kind of research that we do, we do often because it's the research that we care about. It aligns with our, in our field, we have public service values. Um, they are typically equity, uh, equity um, efficiency, um, effectiveness, and economy, right? And so certainly um, this issue around food and food safety and the benefit of food and the role of science um, in allaying fears, I think that these are all really important aspects of economy that we have farmers who depend on uh, biotechnology. We have people who depend on having good supermarkets in their communities. We have um, government who depends on science doing this really important work. And I think that there's probably some way in which we could create a pav- an avenue so that we could talk to each other. And so that would be the news that I think people could use. So I'm gonna say thank you very much um, for allowing me to break out of my um, stay at home order and connect with you. I appreciate that. Feel free to contact me and I'd be happy to share any additional information with you. My email address is rmberryj at ncsu.edu. And um, I have lots of information to share with you and I'd be happy to do so. All right, take care everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barry James. Thank you, Dawn, for having me.